Don't forget, you can reach the latest episode of Potomac Watch anytime. Just ask your smart speaker. Play the Opinion Potomac Watch podcast. From the Opinion pages of The Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Welcome back. Speaking about the polls, in the last few days, there is a new one out in New Hampshire, and notably, it shows Chris Christie rising to second place behind Donald Trump with 9% support, and Ron DeSantis falling to third with 8% support. And here is Chris Christie on Fox News reacting to that poll. I'm in this race for two and a half months, and I've gone from nowhere to second place in New Hampshire. If, if you're Governor DeSantis this morning, you're going to be wondering what the hell happened here. OK, he's been he's been the presumptive front challenger since before he was reelected governor of Florida. I'm now past him in New Hampshire after two and a half months. And yeah, my first goal was to get there. My next goal is to beat Donald Trump. And whether, if he is not willing to show up at the debate, what he's saying is he is unwilling to do two things to defend his conduct both at the end of his presidency and since he left. And he is unwilling to lay out his vision for the future about how to beat Joe Biden. Mane, part of what is so notable about Christie in second in New Hampshire, if that poll turns out to be correct and that result holds, is it does suggest a problem similar to the one that happened in 2016, where the uh, non-Trump faction of the Republican Party was more than 50 percent. But different candidates had different areas of strength, different states that they were strong in. And looking at the polls right now, so Ron DeSantis is still in number two in Iowa. But if you have Chris Christie at number two in New Hampshire, and then looking at South Carolina, DeSantis is in second there still. But Nikki Haley is pretty strong, 13% in the real clear politics average. Tim Scott at 9%. That is their home state, so their base of support. Maybe one of them would drop out and endorse the other. You could add those up. And you could end up in a situation like in 2016, where you have a second place in each of these states, these first three states, won by different candidates, and Trump riding a plurality to victory. Yeah, that's absolutely possible. And I think that everyone who's invested in the Republican Party nominating process, with the exception of Donald Trump, has to be a little bit alarmed by how dispersed support is for all of the challengers at this moment. I think it's fascinating to go back to, say, January of this year. And at that point, Ron DeSantis was coming off of his almost 60 percent reelection uh, vote total and The expectation was that he would be the poll position challenger to Donald Trump. You had a lot of donors pouring in support for him, and there really were discussions about whether any other viable challenger really would emerge and whether we might be headed for essentially a two-person competition. And the entry of so many other candidates since that point and Ron DeSantis' own underperformance on the campaign trail has totally put the kibosh on that possibility. So it seems that as if at least from now until primary time and the beginning of next year, we're going to have all these candidates duking it out and a lot of support divided among them. But I do think it will be interesting to see whether Some of them are willing to drop out Uh, once we do get to the primary stages. It's one thing to stay in when you have, you know, low single digit support in the polls and think, hey, I want to actually put this question in front of voters uh, rather than just looking at these theoretical polls. But if you do start to see underperformance among some of these candidates in a divided field, whether the Republican Party is going to have the discipline that the Democrats had in 2020 to say, now that we're in this process for real and getting close to the point of actually nominating a candidate, is there going to be enough discipline for candidates who have very little shot at the nomination to drop out and allow that support to consolidate in time for a viable alternative to Trump? So I'm not sure I'd put my money on that happening, but I do think that it's still early enough that we can say the dispersion in the field right now does not necessarily mean we're going to go all the way to the nominating convention with all of this division and allow Donald Trump to sail smoothly towards uh, regaining the nomination. Getting some chatter, the guy who is not running for president, at least not right now, that would be Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin. There is some discussion that maybe he could come into the presidential race as a white knight late in the process and unite the factions of the party that don't want to see President Trump nominated again, or at least think that President Trump would not beat Joe Biden in a rematch. And for now, Kate, Glenn Youngkin is focused on winning Virginia's off-year legislative elections. 
He wants a, a Republican General Assembly so that he can pass his agenda. Uh, Kate, you were recently out watching some of these candidates campaign with Glenn Youngkin. What is the message that he's sending to Virginia? Yeah, Kyle, I mean, so even if Youngkin is not the white knight, there's quite a bit to, I think, be learned from what's going on in Virginia right now. As Youngkin is trying to flip the state Senate and needs to pick up a couple seats in some really contested political territory, such as suburban Richmond, Hampton Roads in the southeastern part of the state, and even in some pockets in northern Virginia, like uh, Stafford County near Fredericksburg. But some of the things I think we can learn already is, first of all, he's running a campaign that's rooted on just a a few core issues that voters care about, and that is education, the economy, and public safety. And these are the only things the governor and his candidates, some of which he endorsed in a primary, are talking about on the campaign trail. That is showing some discipline and also a, a good message for some of these districts that are tough to win. Also, the candidates seem to be of good quality for the districts that they're trying to run in. You know, in Stafford County, a Marine wife and teacher, an OBGYN running in Richmond, who I think has a particular credibility on talking about the Republican views on abortion with suburban women voters. So they've chosen some good candidates. They're sticking to some disciplined messages. I don't think this is a, a lock for Yunkin by any means because it's these are tough races and Virginia has been turning more blue in the past 20 years. But if he does manage to flip the state Senate, that would be a huge event. I mean, the, the Republicans haven't uh, controlled all three parts of state government in a decade. And I think if you did see that happen, you start to see some momentum um, to get Yunkin in the White House race. I think there, his optimism and style, political style, is really refreshing. Uh, that's a definitely a plus on his side, but it would be uh, just a huge step up into a real national limelight that at times candidates who have looked very promising in the state, we're just talking about Ron DeSantis, sometimes struggle under that really higher level of scrutiny. So can't be sure, but I think there would be intense pressure to get him in the race and that he might have some salient appeal to some constituencies that Republicans have just been losing and losing with Trump. A couple things I will pull out from Case write-up of the Virginia races over the weekend, and the headline there is a Republican renaissance in Virginia, if listeners want to go find it. One is that Glenn Youngkin does not seem to be ducking the cultural issues that motivate a lot of conservative and Republican voters. So a couple of examples, he supports a statewide ban on abortion after 15 weeks. And he also is talking on the the stump about this law that Virginia passed to put age verification rules on pornography websites. That, again, is something that is a cultural issue, but he's approaching it with a sort of sunny optimism and a problem-solving mentality that is different from what other other Republican governors are offering. The second thing I'll pull out is a poll from Virginia Commonwealth University saying that if Glenn Youngkin were facing Joe Biden in the 2024 contest, he would win in Virginia by 10 points, which is a remarkable statistic. This is a state that Republicans have not carried in a presidential contest since 2004, And a lot of that is just due to the the changing dynamics in Virginia and the balance of it now going to the suburbs in northern Virginia, particularly, and Republican Party's struggles with those kinds of suburban voters, especially in the Trump era. And so it is not hard for me to understand why, Manet, there is this new chatter about maybe Glenn Youngkin is the solution to the Republican Party's 2024 problem. On the other hand, if he is going to wait until he gets the results in these legislative races in November to make a decision about whether to run for president or not, wow, that is is very late. Then he only has a couple months before voters start to go to the Iowa caucus, to the polls in New Hampshire, and that would be a remarkably swift presidential campaign launch and setup if he decides to try to do it. Right. With regard to the timing of a potential Youngkin presidential run. I think that he thinks at this point he's already far too late to mount a conventional campaign, probably thinks there's a much less than 50 percent chance that he'll get in, but thinks that if he does get in, it will be because there's some kind of emergency, essentially 
Trump is consolidating support and you see other candidates, potential challengers beginning to flag or even drop out, DeSantis grossly underperforming, and there really being a groundswell of concern among Republican donors and among Republican primary voters who are looking for an alternative that we need to stand up some kind of emergency challenger and throw our support behind that person. So I think that that's the narrow circumstance in which Youngkin thinks that he would get in, in which case that's something that's going to happen late in the primary process to begin with. And so that probably is how he sees it. But I couldn't agree more with Kay in that even if he doesn't run for president, that Republican governors and Republican presidential candidates have a lot to learn from the way that he's handled his own governorship. I think that his willingness to engage on those cultural issues, restricting sexual content from being taught in public schools and basically pushing back against progressive cultural overreach in government is something that is a winning approach, something that can build big majorities and can appeal to suburban voters when it isn't done with a hyper-aggressive demeanor. I think we saw that with Ron DeSantis on Disney. It was a very popular thing when he first pushed back against Disney for getting involved in his legislation about what can be taught to kids in the classroom. But then he essentially overstretched it by continuing into this long legal battle. And I think that he's aware of that. And so that Yunkin approach of we want to show the parents that were involved in making sure that their kids can get a quality education or not being exposed to bad politics, but doing it in a way that seems sane and serious and competent as opposed to a way that seems to love the fight for the fight's sake is something that can be a winner with the suburban voters that Republicans really need to win back to have any chance of victory in 2024. Thank you, Manet and Kate. Thank you all for listening. You can email us at pwpodcast at wsj.com. If you like the show, please hit that subscribe button and we'll be back tomorrow with another edition of Potomac Watch.